I uh, think of you as uh, one of a generation of female, female senior leaders of large British companies um, of the past two decades. So I'm thinking about people like Kate Swan, mm -hmm. Marjorie Scardino, you were chief executive of Drax. Um, and before we cast back to your early career, I wonder, do you agree with that assessment and what characterises women leaders of your generation? So of course I don't think of myself with those great people because I think they're both, as two you mentioned, very gifted. I think I've been fortunate to run a company that was um, not, not inconsequential, so quite important, but not at that scale. I think, um, I think what characterizes us is that I think we were, in one way, the lucky ones, because I think we wouldn't have got through if we'd had serious resistance. But I think in another way, um, we were probably the blind ones, that we were so determined to do what we wanted to do that we didn't notice the resistance on the way. Because there were few of you. There were yeah, very, very, few, very few. When I when I first was appointed CEO of Drax, I think there were between uh, if you look at the FTSE 350, so the top 350 listed companies. <coughs> I think there were four of us at the time, five of us. And even now, you know, I'm going to become a chairman uh, in about two weeks' time, and it's something like seven percent. I mean, it's it's amazing how low it is. And did you all? meet up together yeah. secretly and, and uh, did you I mean uh, did you all know each other so when I very first was appointed um, uh, I had a, a, a dinner with Cynthia Carroll who at the time had just been appointed to Anglo American and Marjorie Scardino and they were basically there to give me wise advice it was very kind <laughs> <laughs> so it's rare to find a senior woman in the energy industry and I had a chat with our energy correspondent and I said how many senior women are there in energy and she could think of one other and that was uh, Jessica Uhl of who's the CFO of Shell why are there so few senior women in the energy industry so I don't know so so I was the main business I was in was electricity generation and then we grew into electricity retail and production of a renewable fuel but it started with electricity generation, and electricity generation historically was run by engineers for engineers. It just was the way it came into being. And tragically, tragically, there are very, very few women engineers of my generation. Very, very few. And so one of the reasons is if, if you were in an industry that um, naturally promoted the expertise of that industry, then it wasn't very attractive to women. And as I said, some of us were a bit blind, so <laughs> it didn't sort of occur to me when I entered. But I also entered it when I started in the electricity industry. I was already quite well into my career, so it was I was probably about 10 or 15 years into my career. So. Because you started in yeah. a very different sector, Correct. In international development. Yes, so my first nine, nine years of, of working was in, in international development, and um, I was very lucky, and, and I'm sure many people don't know about this, but there's something the UK has been running since the early 60s called the ODI Fellowship. It's run by the Overseas Development Institute. And if you're a postgraduate in the UK, it doesn't matter what nationality, um, in either economics or statistics, you can apply for this fellowship. They give out, I think, about seven or eight a year. And you tell them what job you want to do, but you have no choice of where you go. So I wanted to go into development banking. And I was very lucky to be awarded one of these fellowships, but they sent me to Haberoni in Botswana. And I not only didn't know where Haberoni was, I didn't even know where Botswana was. <laughs> but it was a fantastic experience, and that started me in development banking, and then I spent the next seven years working for Commonwealth Development Corporation. So yeah. we'll, we'll come back to yeah. your, um, your Africa years yeah. shortly. Um, I'd like to start right back at the beginning, right back to your earliest memories. What did you want to be when you grew up? I wanted to. So when I was very, when I was young enough to know what I wanted, I wanted to be a pilot. Um, and unfortunately, my eyesight was never good enough for that. And then, to be honest, I'm not one of those people with ambition. So I didn't have this picture that I was going to run a company or do anything like that. I just wanted to do something that was interesting. That's all I ever wanted. So what sort of family did you grow up in? What did your parents... Ah, so my father was an engineer. Um, my mother um, studied English at university. Um, unusually, my father's half American and half English, and my mother's American. 
uh, but I was brought up in the UK, as I think you can probably hear from my accent. Um, and uh, a very traditional, normal family. But you, you were a sort of an Anglo-American family, so you must have had a sort of an international outlook, which yeah. can be a big advantage for, for women. So my theory sometimes is, because it was a split between American and English, that it didn't hit the conventions of either. And so I have, a, I have one of my sisters has also been chief executive and quite successful in her part, her part, her career, which is different. And, and I think it is because somewhere we didn't have that box which said, you have to fit this box. So you grew up in England? I grew in, up in, in London? I grew, no, I grew up in, in, in Worcestershire and then actually Southern Ireland. Right, okay, so, so you were yeah. moving around. Yeah. 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 And what sort of people did you meet growing up? Who did your parents mix with? And who, who influenced you as a, as, a young, as a young woman, young teenager? I don't think, I don't think it was the people I grew up with and, and my parents that influenced me. Um, they influenced me in who I am as a person, in you know, what I think about how you, I was a family person. But I don't think they influenced what happened in my career. I think what influenced what happened in my career is I went to the London School of Economics. And at that time, and it still is, it was predominantly international. And it was full of people from all different backgrounds and walks of life. And, and it was also at the time, so this was late 70s, early 80s, just a place that was full of ideas and rebellion. And um, I think that's what influenced me. Tell me about some, tell me about some of that. What, who, who did you meet and, and, and who influenced you while you were there, while you were studying? So LSE really did believe um, in excellence in education and in free thinking. We're talking in terms of economics and mathematics. But I remember when, so I did, when I, I did mathematical, economic, mathematical economics and econometrics. So I, in my first year, I did this course called Pure Maths. And the lecturer, who was outstandingly brilliant, about the fourth lecture, turned up in bare feet, middle of winter, in bare feet. <laughs> And it just, it shakes you because it's someone, especially from, I came from quite a conventional upbringing, it, you know, it's someone you know is utterly brilliant, is not conforming at all, but all he's wanting to do is make sure you really understand this mathematical problem. So, yeah. And so it was mathematical, economics, and econometrics. 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 So, which is statistical economics. How many women were there on this course <laughs> of the LSE? <laughs> <laughs> You were the only or woman fine. on your degree course. I was, yes. And what was that like? So, <clears throat> I think, I, unfortunately, I don't, I, don't have a, I don't have a vivid memory of it. I remember being a bit shocked. I went to an all-girls school. Um, uh, I think it didn't really occur to me. I think I was more terrified about whether I could do the course right. And so you went through the LSE, mm -hmm. and then ah. what, how did you decide, what did you decide so I've, I've, to I've, do then? I have two stories to say about this. So one is, is I sometimes tell people who, who are applying or going through interviews this story. So when I was, um, my first year at the LSE, I actually, academically did very well at the LSE, but anyway, so my first year at the LSE, I got, took four exams, and I got a very good first and all four, right? So they put me up for a very unusual scholarship. So I go to this interview panel, and there are probably six or seven people there. And I'm really nervous, but you know, I'm actually very chuffed I did so well. So I go to this interview, and I have this interview. They take me out after the interview, and this woman takes me aside, who's running the process, and says, look, can I give you some advice? Try and avoid interviews when you're going for a job, because you're just not any good at them. <laughs> and it was really one of those, yeah. How do you go apply for a job without having an interview? Exactly. I would love to know. Exactly. That. You, one would never let that sort of thing happen nowadays, would you? But she thought she was doing a nice thing to me. I, mean, I don't know what she thought. But yes. So, 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 so then what happened was then I, I did try and get a job after my first degree. And um, it was really hard. And um, I was then offered another scholarship. <laughs> And I did a master's, which I was very happy to do. And then thereafter, it kind of all became history. Helena Morrissey has talked a lot about the importance of mentors for women 
of, of, of your generation, for her generation, and, and in particular, male sponsors of careers. Who are your mentors and sponsors? So, I don't think for most of my career I've had mentors as such. I've had people who have been my boss, who I have really respected and wanted to learn from, but I haven't had people that are aside from the team I'm working in that I go for counsel. I've always had people who are peers that I've used as counsel and guidance. And I, I say for most of my career, because I just had one of those experiences that you just, um, you realize sometimes you're, you, you're not appreciating what's in front of your eyes. So I'm just about to become a chairman. And a chairman and a chief executive are very different jobs. And a chairman's job is to ensure that the board that is responsible for the company or the organization really does their best to help the organization be excellent but it's not the, their job to run the organization. And so it's a very different role. And in a listed company, there's also an awful lot of code and governance around it that you need to ensure is done well, but not in such a way that you get so caught up in the rules that you're not looking at what's the strategy, they really got the right vision, all of that. So I've worked with lots of other chairmen, and I've had my own chairman, I've sat on boards where there are chairmen, um, and I've been picking up all this sort of what I thought was wisdom from that. I also sat on the board of the Bank of England. The chairman of the Bank of England, who sadly has just sat down, offered to sit with me for an hour or two and give me his wisdom on being a chairman. I don't think I have spent a more useful hour and a half, two hours for a very long time. He had sat down himself and really worked out what, were, what he thought were the gems, were the really important points. And I think it, it, it was a real lesson to me that actually people with real experience, if they really make the effort, can be fantastic in helping one. So what were these gems that he gave? <laughs> 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 no, well, is that really of interest? <laughs> okay. Yeah, I, I mean, yeah, I, mean, I think I, I, I'm very interested in this, the difference between being a chief executive and and then becoming a chair because, you know, the, the, there are plenty of people who think yeah. that maybe it's not the right transition, that maybe yeah. it's not a good idea. So the, the, so the, the first thing he said, um, which really um, struck me, is that actually you need to try and be physically present in the company, probably two days a week, maybe a bit more but not to always be doing in the company, but that you're there, if anyone wants to talk to you, anyone wants to just bounce an idea, you're there to be available. So it's a very different, because when you're a chief executive or, or in an organization, you're there to have your meetings, to get everything through. This is more about a much more subtle thing of actually, chairmen are meant to be there to help the company and be there for advice and counsel, and just get a sense of what's going on. I can't, I can't, I'm trying to work out what I can actually tell you. <laughs> 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 yeah, but that, I mean, that, that sounds like yeah, good advice. Yeah, exactly, very good advice. And there were some others that were very, and, and a lot of it was the um, same as the chief executive, but from a board point of view, really plan forward your board. I mean, most board members of a listed company stay on the board for nine years, which is a long time. So if you're thinking about what you need on your board, Every time you appoint someone, you have to think they're going to be there for nine years. How do you make sure, as the people change, that you really have the right complement? Especially because companies and organisations go through change and change and change. And you've got to be trying to think of the change further ahead rather than the current problem. So, just returning back to your career, we sort of yeah. diverged a bit, but back to your early career. You went into international development after you left yeah. university. You were in Botswana. What was that like? Okay. So this is a, just a conversation. So I arrive in Botswana, really, you know, a little bit out of my depth, and I'm working for the National Development Bank of Botswana, and they do have um, it's uh, and it finances everything from what they call bottle stores, so liquor stores, um, to small hotels, to um, uh, cattle ranches, that sort of thing, and literally. They gave me a desk, they gave me a chair, and I think they just expect me to sort of put on my makeup every day. <laughs> because they were so proud to have me, 
that that was kind of achieved in that point. Of course, I got bored very quickly. And I had a, a very, very good and nice manager called Arthur Kodinsky. And slowly but surely, they realized that I genuinely was there to work. And that's what I wanted to do. And um, over time, it built up. And by the time I left, I was running a team of three or four people. And um, it was a really interesting job. And then you moved to... So then, the I, then I came back. And um, I considered either going into merchant banking or development banking. But my heart wasn't really in the merchant banking. So I was offered a job at the Commonwealth Development Corporation. Uh, which used to be called the Colonial Development Corporation. And it was formed in 1948, and India had become independent in 1947. So they had never invested in India, and they decided they were going to invest in India because it had become the Commonwealth Development Corporation by this time. And so they hired me to be a financial analyst um, on their brand new portfolio that they were trying to develop into India. And the thing about CDC, which I only realized, I realized later on in life, is what CDC would do is they would send a financial analyst like myself out, and you'd always go with a technical expert, so either an engineer or an agriculturalist or a forester, and you'd work as a team, sometimes with external advisors. And it was a really good lesson for me right early in my career, because firstly, that thing about spe different specialisms working together to get the right solution. But also, it must be said that actually quite often, you know, when you look at an investment and try and understand it's right, some of it's whether the numbers work, some of it's whether the technologies work, but an awful lot of it is, are the markets right, are the people right, you know, it's a lot more than that. And I found, I discovered at CDC an awful lot of that just fell on my lap, because it was assumed that as a financial analyst you do all these other aspects as well. And um, it taught me so much, because you find yourself confronted by having to make a judgment on something you don't really understand that well yourself. And so you have to learn, you have to ask people, you really have to build your knowledge. So it was a wonderful experience. And that's quite common, isn't it? I mean, anyone building a career will, will come across this. They'll find <coughs> themselves out of their depth or out exactly. of their sphere of experience. Yes. And it's, it's something that women are perhaps um, less prepared for than men. I mean, I hear this a lot, that you know, men are able to sort of bluff their way through, whereas w women are sort of play down their, their experiences and are more likely to back off. I don't know if it's true, but that's the sort of received wisdom. What do you think about that? Helen, I think it goes slightly the other way around. I, 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 I don't like to generalise, but it is true that women are generally less confident than men. And if you're less confident, then you're bound to think someone else can do it better. Um, whereas there's nothing to say either is better than the other. But I think that there are also lots of women, you know, I've worked with loads of them, who, when there's a problem, that they're meant to be dealing with this here, but this problem crops up here, they'll recognize it and try and solve both rather than just focus on what they've been told to do. And so you, you finished working with, with the Development Bank, mm. and then you moved into energy. <laughs> How did that come about? So, um, the, so when, I, when I worked for CDC, I, I did two years in India, but then I, I went and worked in Malaysia for three years, and then I came back, and, and I did quite a lot of work on Africa. But ironically, my last project was in the Philippines, and it was the very first um, private power plant in the Philippines. And uh, what happens with those sort of projects is the government lets a contract for 20 years to buy the electricity and on the basis of that contract uh, a private sector entity then builds the power station, runs it, operates it. And it was the very first time I'd seen anything like that and it was fascinating and complex and really interesting. And the UK had privatised about three years before and um, I, they were one of the privatised companies was looking for someone to run the project finance team for their international investments and I thought well that's perfect for me so that's what I did so did they approach you or did no, you no I approached them I saw an advert probably in the FT <laughs> <laughs> I don't think we carry those they <laughs> <laughs> the, the print yeah. yes yeah yeah so Okay, so that, how many women were working? When, when you arrived, how many women did you find in the team? None. None? No. <laughs> so this, I mean, this is a recurring theme, right, right from, you went to an all-girls school. Yes. But since you left that school, it strikes me that there's a common theme here, that every time you move on, you're the only woman. Yes. 
But I said I'm blind. I mean, I went to CDC. Um, CDC is sort of, uh, it was a celebration thing. And I was the first professional woman they'd hired. Yes. And uh, I knew I was the first one they'd sent overseas. Yeah. And how did that feel every time you came I think up, I, into this? <laughs> I remember PowerGen being a little bit um, frustrated with myself that I'd put myself in that position again. Um, and actually, we, one of the early projects I did was with a, a co-financing with the IFC. And um, there was a woman on the team, and we had great fun <laughs> whenever we did projects. But it was just the reality of my career. It wasn't. Yeah. So you became chief executive of Drax. How did that come about? OK, so, so I, I worked at PowerGen, and then PowerGen changed strategy and had domestic strategy. So it was obvious that <coughs> my job was coming to an end. I joined a, a joint venture between Shell and an American company, Bechtel that developed power projects all over the world, and I joined, I'd stopped, I, I changed from being a financier, which I'd been up to that point, and I joined to run their team that set up these new projects. And it just, not, not all over the world, just in um, the Middle East and Europe. And I really loved that, but uh, after a few years, I actually found myself thinking, I actually want to run something. I'd, I'd ended up going more senior on a sort of regional level, but I just wanted to run something. And we just financed uh, a new power station in the UK and a new power station in the Netherlands. So we'd signed all the documents, we had all the contracts, we basically had to build it, hire the people to run it, and then operate it. And everything from how you trade the output. And I asked to do that. I was not very popular because it was in, in some ways going backwards. Um, and um, so that's what I did. And it was absolutely what I like doing and uh, so I ended up running the whole of their European business and um, which was four power stations at the time and then I was headhunted uh, to join Drax and Drax at the time produced 8% of the UK's power, it was in very troubled state but very strategic and uh, I decided to take up the offer so I became Drax's CEO. And you have been credited with <coughs> overhauling the strategy completely at Drax, mm. from uh, fossil fuel to renewables. Um, did you know from the start that that was the direction you were going to go? Did you know that was the task when you took the job? No. So when I, when I joined Drax, um, we, I knew carbon was a problem. I knew it was a serious issue for Drax. Um, in the UK, what had happened, or in Europe, what had happened is... so. When I joined Drax, the, actually the year I joined Drax, the UK was about to permit a new coal station in the UK. Right? It's amazing when you think about it, because right now that coal station will be facing closure, and that's only 12 years ago. But the government, and it takes four years to build one of these stations, and they normally run for 30, 50 years. So the idea of 12 years ago, the government was going to say, yes, you can do it. Uh, but in parallel, what had happened in Europe, including the UK, is a really big movement to make the polluters pay, at least in, 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 in generating industries and industries that produce carbon dioxide. So what had happened is a trading scheme had been introduced where everyone began to have to pay for every tonne of carbon dioxide. Well, Drax was the, by, by, by location, the largest producer of carbon dioxide in the UK. So it was very clear that we were going to have a real threat to our business if we continued like that, because we were just at the start of carbon pricing. And at the time, actually sadly it hasn't really happened, but at the time the expectation is eventually the price people, gen you know, industry paid for carbon would reflect its true cost to society. It doesn't reflect it, but that's what we all believed would happen. So when I joined Drax, that was clear, but the bigger problem at Drax when I very first joined, it was in serious financial distress. So it had too much debt, not enough equity. And so my first sort of six months were all about sorting out that. And then once that was sorted, we all put our, our thinking hats together and said, well, look, it's very clear we've got one really big strategic issue, and that is how do we address carbon? And it wasn't a very easy thing to solve. It was very, very difficult to solve and took us you know, many, many years. But we decided to make it, this, and I say we, because what happens is you, you come to this conclusion as an executive team, or you come to the idea as an executive team, you take it to your board, 
the board debates it, the board sort of says, yeah, we kind of agree with you. You go back and you start fleshing it out better and better. So it really is a sort of partnership thing. But it did became, it became what we championed, and the only route we could do it was quite a difficult route. Um, but we were relatively successful. So you positioned Drax as a, as a clean challenger, and, and it was almost a disrupting uh, you know, yeah. of the dominance of the big six. Yes, that was How true. did you, I mean, how did you negotiate with your, I mean, how did you relate to your peers at the big, at the big six, the other chief executives of the energy companies? So the, the very nice thing about energy is, uh, or generation, you start with generation, is you have this, um, cooperation right at the center and and the reason you have the cooperation is you start with safety so running these very large um, factories are, is inherently dangerous and the everyone can try and be as good as they can at safety but the more people who are trying to be good the better it gets so across the electricity industry the information sharing on safety is fantastic it really is fantastic and that creates a culture of cooperation. And so I'd say we got on very well, not always. <laughs> you know, sometimes a bit of competitive tension, but um, there, is a, there is a real sense across the industry that we need to work together. I mean, I don't think it's always successful, but there is a real sense. So. And then you, uh, the, the, the other big uh, problem with leading any strategic shift in organization um, is always the internal communications. Mm. How did you do that? How did you take the organization with you? So first I'd say, as a, as a new CEO, it took me longer than it should have to understand the importance of internal communications. And I think it's, it's, it's in some ways, almost the most important thing. Because once, once the people in the company, everyone, believes what, what, what you know, direction is right, then you've just got this enormous force trying to solve it. But if you're always battling with each other as to what's the way forward or what's the solution, um, we, we spent a lot of time, myself um, particularly, just with people. We used to, when I first went, we used to, so at that time there were probably about a thousand people in Drax, and we used to have about four, four uh, about two or three times a year, presentations to about 400 people at once, or 200, yeah, I mean, disaster really, that's not a way to communicate with people. And we realized we just weren't getting through, and my then head of HR said, you just got to take it down to groups of 20 or 30 people. And what's more, this is a, it's a facility that runs 24 7. So you have to do it through all the shifts. You have to do it late into the night. You have to do it very early in the morning. Completely changed. I mean, I don't think you could do that forever because it actually is very, very time consuming. But it worked. We called them open forums and it worked really well because it meant you had a conversation with all these people. So when you were um, holding the open forums, going to visit 20 or 30 people at a time on shifts, how many women were? <laughs> did you meet? So Drax is, so we, not, that, so I am in an industry, or I was in an industry, I'm not anymore, but I was in an industry that was very, very few women. Um, over time, uh, across the industry certainly, but also at Drax, there is, it's changing. So I remember the first time, and she's a great woman actually, we hired a female safety officer. That is a pretty brave job for a woman to do because a safety officer has to be willing to stand anyone down instantly to stop any operation at any time if you see something unsafe. So you know, it has to be this gentle, soft woman, absolutely fantastic success. I mean, really, you know, still at drags. And, so it wasn't in Drax. I don't think um, the fact there weren't that many women, but they are coming through now. A lot of a lot of women apprentices, a lot of trainees, and now there are more women engineers. So more women engineers coming in. Um, I don't think. I, I actually genuinely think there was never any resistance. I just think we, in the past, have not been proactive enough at searching them out, and probably not welcoming enough. Um, and also, there weren't that many around. Indira Noy of Pepsi Cola has said that she thinks there's a duty for senior women to be role models um, to other women to, to bring up that pipeline. Do you do you agree with that? What, what is the obligation for senior women to guide the next generation and provide elite role models into leadership? 
Because those engineers that are coming through yeah. may one day aspire to a career like yours. So when, when I left Drax, I got a disturbing amount of messages from women saying, it is so sad that we're losing our female CEO. So it wasn't not about me personally, but just having a woman there that they all thought, this is possible, this is... Um, I think, I think, I think that it's like anything else. If it, if people can see that someone can get to that level, and that person, for whatever reason, is like them, you know, it could be, it could be, could be, sorry, but it could be that they're gay, it could be that they're, it, you know, I don't know, dark skin. Choose your thing. As long as people know it's possible, then it gives the opportunity. If you just see white middle-aged men, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, I mean, would you agree with with in, in doing? I, I do, I do, and, and I think the mentoring thing. I think it's. Um, I think that there I have a, a, a little more of a pause because I actually think, well, it tracks we set up a thing that um, the, the graduate trainees. I would spend, I don't know, in the first year, probably three one-hour sessions with them. <coughs> But I wouldn't have been happy if that had been only the female ones. I mean, I think it applies equally on mentoring. Everyone benefits from it. So I think we're coming to the end of the time we have. So I've got two more questions that I'm absolutely dying to ask you. First of all, what's it like being in the limelight? Do you enjoy it and, and how do you cope? You know the answer now. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I am not an a, a enthusiastic public speaker, and actually I didn't give a presentation until I was in my mid-30s. And when I was in my mid-30s, I was working at PowerGen, this UK generator, and I was working on the finance side, and with the international division was doing projects, and it was like war in factions. And I knew all I wanted to do was have their projects be in such a good state that we could raise the money for it but I just wasn't getting through. So I persuaded myself to give a presentation to the International Division on why project finance was important, why that actually dovetailed with how they designed the power station, whether it was insurable, all the things. And I, I don't think I've ever been so terrified in my whole life, but I was really determined. I, I had to I'd solve this bridge or we wouldn't go forward. And it was a real success. I mean, it was a real success and it taught me that you, know, you have to be willing to get up there and talk when you need to give a message. And if you want to list a company, you basically are on a platform an awful lot of the time because the, whether it's your shareholders, whether it's your staff, whether it's journalists. So I think it's, um, there are some people who are naturally comfortable in the limelight and there are some people who are not terribly naturally comfortable in the limelight. I'm the latter. Um, I uh, do it reluctantly, I don't do it um, unless specifically asked, <laughs> uh, but I do it whenever it's necessary and I think it's going to either help someone, help, help the organisation I'm working for, I'll do it then. Do, do, do you seek out training and help and support for, for speaking in the limelight? I tried that, but um, I don't, I am oh gosh I'm sorry I don't know how to say this. I just say I, I'm a very, very um, honest, straightforward person. So I'm not very good at sort of being trained to say the right thing at the right time. I just tend to say what I think. Because there are no shortage of public <laughs> speaking experts who will come and train yeah. you and help no, you. No, no, I had one and they told me, they told me um, it was very funny, they said, well, right, oh, Dorothy, whenever you present, you must put your hands in your pockets like this because you might fidget. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, okay, my mother would think that was very discourteous to get <laughs> <laughs> So no help, no help. Um, oh, there is some help, but no, no. So the, the, there are, I, I have had a lot of briefings and training, and, and you know, there are things like, you know, keep it simple, don't get complex. If you're actually really trying to get a subject across, something across, be on subject, keep on subject, because actually it takes time for anyone to understand exactly what you mean. Really. One last question, which you'll be relieved to hear. <laughs> um, what would you advise young women today? So I met someone last week who is um, who 
funds and then runs startups, technology startups. And he has a friend who's who has been an incredible woman, very, very successful on a very complex data startup, very successful. Now sits on the board of a very famous US company. And uh, apparently he's about the same age as me. And he said, uh, you know, I think the reason she's so successful is because what she's always trying to do, it's a bit what I've been saying, is look at what needs to be done and solve it and not worry about whether the person cares whether they're male or female, you know, underqualified, overqualified, just focus on what you need to do. And I think when people come to me for advice, the first thing I always say is do what you enjoy. Don't stay in a job that you don't enjoy because people only excel when they enjoy what they're doing. And the second thing I'm now going to say to people, <laughs> focus on what you need to achieve. Don't get worried by all the periphery around that you might think is prejudice or something else because actually just focus and be good. Both excellent pieces of <laughs> advice. <laughs> so, so. Um, Dorothy Thompson, thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you.